Hi, and welcome to Visible Necessary, Australia's period podcast series on everything you ever wanted to know about the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Brought to you by the Summer Foundation. I'm your host, Dr. George Talaporis, and in this episode, I'm speaking with the CEO of the Austin Hospital, Adam Horsberg, about why so many people are stuck in hospital waiting for their NDIS decisions. But first, we're reaching NDIS participant Layla Bohin and her sister Helen, who's been stuck in hospital for almost a year, waiting for housing and support. Check it out. Hi, Lee. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, you're in the hospital, aren't you? That's right. Why? I've had a stroke. How long have you been in hospital? Since April last year. Okay, and now it's March. So yep. that's 11, 12 months. Yes, by the time I leave. That's a very, very long time. Yes, very long time. Very frustrating. Why? Why have you been in hospital for so long? Because, can I say? Yeah. It's of NDIS. Uh huh. Helen, do you want to tell us a bit more as to why they was in hospital for so long? Sure. Um, There was an application for support under the NDIS, which was actually submitted on behalf of LEI, pulling together all of the various reports and assessments as as is required. Um, But, uh, and that was submitted in August. So there was a, a lapse of time from the point of admission to the point of um submission of a support application to the NDIS. However, um, it took until just before Christmas in 2021, so eight, almost nine months after Lee had been admitted to hospital for the outcome of that application to be confirmed by the NDIS. Eight or nine months. Yeah. In hospital waiting. Yeah. That's that's extraordinary and really unacceptable. I'm sorry about that, Leila. That's that that would be very hard. What, what's it like for you being in hospital for so long? Well, my daily activities is is um, George is I I do um, PT, mm-hmm. which is I love and arm arm therapy, which I love also. And the staff are fantastic. And I don't begrudge the staff at all. I begrudge NDIS. It must be very, very hard to uh, be inside that same room, especially during COVID. You You were there when uh, the lockdown, uh, when there were restrictions on who could come in. What, what was that like for you? Well, I, 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 I could contact my family um, via Zoom or via Messenger, but it was horrible. It was horrible. I couldn't see, I couldn't have visitors, which annoyed me. How was that for you, Helen? Oh, I think it was challenging for all of us. Um, you know, seeing someone over a screen uh, is absolutely no substitute from, you know, touching them or smelling them or, you know, just being tactile with them. Um, and it's it's just a completely different medium. It, it almost it doesn't feel as meaningful to be communicating in this way. So... Um, it was. It has been incredibly challenging for us as a family to feel as though we're supporting Lee 
through what is a very, very difficult time for her. So I'd, I'd like to understand a bit more about what it was about the NDIS and what went wrong in terms of uh, the NDIS process. Helen, are you able to help people to understand that a little bit more? Um, I, well, I, I guess I feel that there was perhaps a bit of a disconnect in terms of what the expectations were by us as a family, um, the time that it took necessarily to pull together all of the reports and all of the threads of information that were required, that, that took some time, but I appreciate that time was necessary at that point to, to be sure and confident that that information was as comprehensive as it could be. I think though that once it was submitted, you, you, you kind of felt that you'd suddenly, you weren't in control, you weren't even able to influence anything. Um, and it took time for a meeting to be scheduled um, and, you know, to, to get people together for that meeting to be held. And then when that meeting was held, everyone was absolutely lovely. You might remember, Lee. Um, yes, they it were. Was a really, it was a really lovely conversation. Yes. But then subsequent to the conversation and in a follow-up call with the, the case manager who hosted that meeting... I kind of understood it, it was sort of jarring. What our expectations were, were very different to what was ever going to be entertained under the NDIS. And, you know, the NDIS made a decision and that initial decision was, so our application centered around 24 seven carefully in her own home um, and we were, I feel, we were led to believe that that was a possibility and it was rudely apparent that that was never on the cards. When you think about the process, what a, what a, I mean, the, the time, the time is what really stands out to me. The, the, the fact that, you know, I, I imagine that the there would have been uh, an, uh, a real sense of, is this ever going to happen? Will I ever get out? Is that right, Leila? Yes. I, I felt I, I was trapped. It was like a prison. And when you think about how the, the, the process, though, how do you feel it should have gone? What would have worked? Well, I work in compliance, George. So um, we have processes and there are, all of our processes are built around a basic assumption. And that is that any matter referred must be dealt with within a specified time. So there is absolute clarity from parties to a complaint about where the beginning and the end is. And the process is made to fit. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's always possible to fit square pegs into round holes, but there must be, there has to be, for people's mental and emotional health, if nothing else, a sense of what a calendar looks like for the purpose of an application and its evaluation and assessment. And I feel that there was just a massive disconnect between the hospital and their expectations of the NDIS and what the NDIS were ever going to do for my sister. 
And as a family, we were kind of prisoner to that expectation because we didn't have any benchmarks. I mean, God forbid families following us are possibly experiencing those same pinch points of frustration and helplessness that we have because there is a lack of a, a process map of what you can expect and when. It beggars belief for me, George. It beggars belief. I think that you're absolutely right. That the, the, there needs to be a, a really clear understanding, but more so a clear sense of urgency that if you're in hospital, if you're healthy enough to leave, that your plan is ready for you to exit. It's, it's costing the government a lot of money to keep someone in hospital. Why would you want to drag that out? Yeah. So our original application was rejected. We were then, you know, we then had to retreat, <laughs> you know, and, and re reevaluate. But we are then provided with another case manager by the NDIS, which to me was a basic flaw in the system. Uh, why is that? It, it's the lack of continuity. Yeah. If, it's like an insurance claim, you know? If you if you have an accident in your car, you want to be dealing with the same person at the insurance company mm. because they've got your history there. Having to repeat your history and go back to go and not collect $200 every time is not efficient. It's also dehumanising. It would be, and it's also... I imagine that for, for you, Ida, and for you, Helen, that it would have felt like you were back at the start, back at square one. The only, the only thing added was that we had a better sense of where the boundaries were for the NDIS in terms of what they were prepared to entertain. That was the difference. Mm -hmm. Now, Rayla, I'm interested in uh, where you are now. So, 11 months on, and um, I heard that very recently um, you were told um, that you would get out of hospital very soon. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about that? It's not a house, it's um, another transition care. It's another transitional care. Oh, okay. Here to another place. Why, why aren't you, oh, and Helen, you might be the one to answer this. Why, why do we need another stop? Why can't we, why can't we end this? This is going on for a long time. I think this is where a process map would be really interesting, George, <laughs> um, because I, I guess the, um, I think you're right, should there actually need to be this step, and I think it's a yes and a no answer. Because Leela has been in hospital for so very long, I think the idea of a traditional uh, transitional care stop is a very important one for Lee because it's one dolly step towards her life beyond <clears throat> rehab and hospital. If Lee's stay in hospital had not been as long as it has, and we are coming up to a year, mm. I, I, I would be much more enthusiastic yes. about Lee going into a more permanent accommodation arrangement. Because she's been out of that environment for so long, I think there are some inherent benefits 
of a transitional care stop. That being said, from a family perspective, our impetus and, and our motivation since, since the NDIS decision was delivered to us on the 23rd of December, it's just been to get her out of hospital. We just want to get Lee out of rehab. And we don't have more permanent accommodation lined up for her yet. We are still searching for that. So the opportunity to take a transitional step to get her out of hospital and to get her in an environment which is more normal, in inverted commas, uh, just... We only became aware of that very late last week. It's now Tuesday. As far as we're concerned, the sooner she can get into transitional care, the better. But you're right, it should not be an additional step for everyone. And I hope it isn't. Yeah, I hope it isn't too. I mean, you're, sounds like you're gonna get out of hospital soon. What are you looking forward to doing when you get out of hospital? I'm looking forward to meeting friends and coffee. Coffee? Yes, I, I, I tend to socialise in a basketball stadium. <laughs> so I'm going to go into that uh, basketball. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. How's the coffee in the hospital? Shit. <laughs> yes. I'd like to start ask both of you uh, this question. And um, I'll start with uh, you, Helen. What what message do you have for uh, politicians and decision makers about your um, family's experience of being stuck in the hospital for almost a year now? Um, I, I, I really, I don't, I would, when I start, George, I'm not going to know where to stop, but I, I do think that there is such a massive disconnect, even for staff working within the NDIS, between them, the, the clients of the NDIS, the families of the NDIS clients, there's such a massive disconnect between them and the politicians who determined that this program is a good idea. And the idea of it is very good. It's the application of it that is now fundamentally and fatally flawed because there are people who sit behind every one-dimensional case file, you know, and there's a ripple effect every decision that is taken in relation to that one dimensional case file ripples out to the community that, of the person that that file represents. So when they're slow, when they're inefficient, you know, when their decisions don't align with expectation, the ripple effect is enormous. And, and to me, the only way that people can appreciate that without being patronising, you know, don't tell me you understand. You've got to live it to understand. You've got to experience it to understand. And I'm not saying I, I do completely understand because this is just the beginning of our NDIS journey so I'm just starting it in with my sister. But they've got to they've got to just spend a day with a caseworker and just hear it, see it, feel it. And then don't tell me the solution is money or we're working on it or just don't give me the poly poly pandering speak. I'm not interested. Action. And information that, that is honest information that tells you what the turns and the twists and the pitfalls are. 
not just talk it up and tell us it's a dream and, you know, lots of glossy brochures with photos of smiling people and smiling carers. It ain't that, George. It isn't that. It's language that you don't even know what it means <laughs> and no glossary of terms anywhere. I mean, it's a, t it's a parallel universe. Yeah, and I think that's that there is uh, your own action, not words. Oh, you've got to go for Parliament, George. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, can I ask you, as someone who's been in hospital for almost a year and has gone through everything that you've been through, what's yeah. your message to politicians, to the NDIS? Um, and to government. Can I be blunt? Go on. Bullshit. They're all bullshits. <laughs> that's my, that's my. Well, you put them in my shoes. You put yeah. them in my shoes. And you get them to live, uh, live like, a day like me. Absolutely, Layla. I think that that's an important message. Look, I want to thank both of you for, for talking. I know it's, uh, it is hard to have these conversations, but it's important that, that people hear what, what's happening on the ground. And I can see you there in, in the hospital, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping that, that you'll be out very soon, Myla. Thank you. And thank thanks you. for your time. Thank you, both of you. Cheers, George. It was good to chat. That was Layla Bohem and her sister, Helen Milovanovic. So why is this happening? My next guest, Adam Horsberg, is the CEO at the Hospital Hospital, where this kind of situation is far too common. He is here to help us understand the scale of the problem and what needs to be done to resolve it. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the show. Thank you, George. A pleasure to be here. So how common is Leila's experience? Yeah, unfortunately, Leila's experience is very common across the health system, both here in Victoria and I think across all of Australia. Um, at any given point in time, we would have a number of people here at Austin Health who are in a similar position to her. Uh, and I think every major hospital in Victoria uh, would be able to say exactly the same thing. And how does that affect the hospital? Like the, the whole system is, is uh, clearly affected in this kind of situation, right? That's right. And, you know, as Leela's story indicates, the really the main impact is on the individual themselves. It means that they're not able to progress in the way that they wish to and need to uh, because we're really not as a hospital set up to meet uh, her or similar people's needs. But for the hospital itself, it also means that that bed uh, is occupied by an individual who could and should be somewhere else. And therefore, we can't use that bed to admit people who need to come into the hospital through the emergency department in a timely way to receive acute health care. So, it really does mean there's a delay to other people being able to access the bed, uh, as well as that individual really not being in an environment that best meets their needs. Oh, absolutely. And I, I would imagine that the, the health impacts on the individual would be quite significant because, you know, if you're in hospital, it's, it's not the, the best place to be to, uh, to rehabilitate, is it? Uh, no, absolutely not. So, you know, we provide wonderful care to many patients for their acute or subacute episode, but we're, as you say, we're not set up for someone's long-term rehab goals. That's not what hospitals and our staff are trained and expert in doing. So it really is uh, impacting on the progress that individuals can make, uh, as well as I said, meaning that our beds are not available for those whose needs really suit uh, the skills and experience of our staff. I also think in a pandemic, 
This is a special problematic. Yeah, that's right. There's no doubt that hospital beds are under pressure at any time, uh, but particularly during the past two years as we've been trying to focus our resources and our staff on our pandemic response. And here at the Austin, we've admitted at different points in time a large number of COVID positive patients. Uh, and we've really needed our beds to be available to help with the pandemic response. So why is this happening, Alan? It's happening you know, because, in, in essence, in very simple terms, um, it often takes far too long for an NDIS assessment to be undertaken. Um, and then often, even if that assessment has been completed, for the approval to be given uh, for the package of support that that individual needs. So while all of that is going on, which can take weeks and sometimes months, or unfortunately in some individuals' cases years, uh, we become the default place of residence for that person. So, you know, this is a significant problem across the system. It's affecting individuals, it's affecting hospitals, and it's also impacting those patients who could otherwise get access to that hospital bed. Is, there, is this a problem that's getting worse or is it getting better? Uh, I think if you looked at the past three to four years, we'd have to say the problem is getting worse in terms of we see more people in our hospital who are waiting for their NDIS assessments and their packages to be approved. There was some improvement during the early stages of the pandemic when a lot of uh, emphasis was put on trying to fast track some of those approvals. But unfortunately, that improvement was fairly short lived. Um, and for most of the pandemic, and certainly now, uh, we're back to experience very long lead in times for those approvals to be provided. That's really interesting. So you're saying that there was a period where there was fast tracking by the NDA, and that, that, that's no longer the case. So uh, it seems like they can do it when they want to. Yeah, and I'm not entirely clear, you know, what form that fast tracking uh, took, but we certainly saw uh, reduced time in some cases uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, but that has not been sustained. Um, we, we have little visibility into NDIA uh, and their processes, so it's hard for me to comment, but... I can only say from a hospital perspective, we haven't seen improvements sustained and we're, we're pretty much back now where we were pre-pandemic. So what is the solution, Alan? Look, I think the solution you know, probably takes many forms, but in essence, what we would be hoping is that these assessments can be conducted quickly um, and that the packages can be approved much more quickly. Um, there, there's no reason why an NDIS assessment or approval of a package needs to take so much longer than, for instance, the approval for someone to enter residential aged care. Um, so if we could try and get these NDIS packages approved in a similar time frame that we can often achieve for residential aged care, um, then that would mean that you know, people aren't being stuck in our beds for the current attractive periods of time that we currently see. Isn't that realistic? Um, I think sometimes we have to be uh, bold um, and set really hard targets because if we're not, then we're unlikely to change the status quo. So whether ultimately that is achievable, um, I think is something that we really need to push hard and test rather than say at the outset that it's not possible. It, it's definite that we can make an improvement from where we currently are. And I'd like to see that improvement to be as significant as we possibly can make it. I absolutely hope so as well. Um, for labor's sake, but also for people who are, are waiting for hospital beds. Alan Horsberg, thank you for your time. Thank you, George. My pleasure. That's all we have time for on today's episode of Reasonable and Necessary, brought to you by the Summer Foundation. To be notified of future episodes, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay well and reasonable.